Pick up and read some political science books and I guarantee you that you are going to always encounter one specific phrase. Getting to Denmark. Getting to Denmark is a kind of meme in political science and in particular in developmental economics. It exists because of Denmark's consistency in high living standards. For almost an entire century, Denmark has ranked amongst the top 10 countries in the world, usually as number one, in highest average living standard, lack of poverty, ease of doing business, quality of public services, government accountability and transparency, freedom of the press, quality of life, quality of healthcare, infrastructure development, and this also consistently the least corrupt country in the world. Developmental economics is a field of economics that researches and tries to develop policies to improve societies by reforming and restructuring institutions with the intent to improve political, economic and social structures. As a result of that, when political scientists and economists talk about improving the political and economic conditions of a country, with Denmark being consistently the gold standard in development, they started to say that they were trying to get the country to be more like Denmark, and hence getting to Denmark became a sort of meme. On the surface, this seems like a great idea. Denmark is a society that works, so let us just copy what works. Denmark has very strict anti-corruption laws and fiscal transparency regulations, which certainly contribute to Denmark's low ranking on the international corruption scale. But the Philippines also have strict anti-corruption laws and regulations, yet they are one of the most corrupt countries in Asia. Simply copying a law does not bring the result you wish to achieve unless you bring with that law the institutional framework that ensures the law has the desired effect. The government institutions of Denmark work because the Danish people trust those institutions, while the institutions of the Philippines are not trusted to function by the Filipinos. Therefore, to understand how we can get to Denmark, we first have to ask how Denmark got to Denmark. To get there, we have to ask a question that is barely ever asked. How did democracy come to Denmark? We all have a surface level understanding of how other democracies developed. We know the historic developments that led to English democracy. We also know how French democracy developed. But a mistake often made is the assumption that those two are the only paths to liberty. Some Brits make the mistake of assuming that Anglo-American democracy was the only true path to democracy and that democracy is Britain's gift to the world, while some French people see French republicanism as the only pure and true form of democracy there is. Scandinavia is just conveniently ignored in this. You will find an occasional casual mention of Danish parliamentary democracy being established in 1849, but how it came to be is ignored in popular history. Democracy just appeared out of nowhere, and that seems to be it. But that is not the case. Scandinavia took its own path, separate from Britain, America and France, unique in its development, which formed the foundation of modern social democracy. There's a prevailing myth that the origins of Scandinavian democracy can be found in pagan Germanic tribal social organization. However, this ignores that the Scandinavians were not the only Germanic peoples marauding through Europe. So did the Franks, Saxons, Visigoths, Lombards, and the Ostrogoths. It also ignores the fact that the Norsemen did not simply stay in Scandinavia. Viking marauders established Viking kingdoms in England, Ireland, Scotland, and France. Let's take the French Viking Kingdom, since it had the longest political impact as an example. The Normans, a Viking people who raided France, were granted lands by the Franks in exchange for peace, established the Duchy of Normandy, and developed feudal governing institutions of absolute monarchy. Norman law, by which the early Norman kingdoms were governed, is distinctively Nordic. The legal text may be in French, but includes Nordic loanwords, and refers to Scandinavian customs such as Danish marriage, that being marriage of women to men of lower social standing, the kidnapping of the bride into forced marriages without the approval of her father, or a form of polygamy by which a man could abandon a wife to just move on to the next, a set of distinctively Viking practices. The prime 
feature of Norman law is its extreme feudalism. All rights are exclusively reserved to the Duke. He is the only one who can grant privileges and rights and is the sole judge and executioner of justice. The law underlines the importance of family, clearly outlining that inheritance must go down the eldest son. The law excludes women of all rights and places them under a system of patrimonialism. Women cannot marry, they can only be given away by their fathers, fatherless women have to be given away by their brothers. This Nordic law, in fact, reinforces feudalism. Far from being different or even rebellious against feudalism, as some popular historians falsely claim, the Norse people took feudal law and drove it into an extreme. They even disrupted non-feudal social structures and customs. Before the Normans conquered England, its laws had been a set of Frankish and Saxon customs. When a property owner died, his inheritance was split up evenly amongst all his children. After the Norman conquest, property had to be inherited down the eldest son, or it would go back to the Lord. Before the Normans, judgment of criminals was undertaken by a Lord Justice. After the Norman conquest, feudal lords exerted justice as their exclusive right. The guilty were now expected to pay a fine to the court and thereby to the king, and trial by combat was also introduced. With the Normans also came the notion that all land was property of the king and that those living upon it were granted the temporary privilege of that land. The romanticized image of an ancient Viking liberty is simply not true. It's a recent trend in popular history to market and present Vikings as romantic explorers and settlers. The Vikings were actually marauders, raiders, slavers and conquerors who conquered European lands and then became European feudal lords. They also converted to Christianity and became feudal lords back at home in Scandinavia. Scandinavia became a decentralized feudal society with a king at its center. The monarch was weak. By the 13th century, his rights had been bound and limited by a charter which the aristocracy had made him sign. This meant that the centralized state was too weak to organize standing armies or state institutions and could therefore not fend off the German Holsteins who conquered large parts of southern Denmark. Medieval Scandinavia was not that different from the rest of medieval Europe. There's one thing that developed medieval Scandinavia different from the rest of Europe, geography. Its rugged geography makes the use of roads difficult, especially during the winter. You couldn't just call a snowplow to clear the streets in 14th century Gotland. But what there was a lot of was coastline. This resulted in seafaring becoming common and thanks to the abundance of lumber, easy as a means of transportation. It also resulted in a significant socio-economic development. The proximity to the Hanseatic League and its free cities meant that great commercial wealth was very close. Trade in the rest of medieval Europe was mostly facilitated through roads and river networks. Roads and rivers that could be controlled by different lords who would then extract tolls from any merchants who used them. However, no aristocrat owned the North and Baltic seas. If you wanted to take part in the Hanseatic trade, all you needed to do was build a boat, load what you had to sell and set out into the sea. This gradually started to disrupt the manorial economy of medieval Europe in Scandinavia. Trade, or any commercial activity for that matter, was severely restricted throughout medieval Europe. You had to gain trading licenses from kings and pay the heavy tolls that lords put on the use of their roads. As a result of this, economic power lay almost entirely with the aristocracies, unless you lived in a free city. But in Scandinavia, no king and no lord had the means to regulate and tax the sea. Commercial activity therefore began to spread among the Scandinavian peasantry, unrestricted by the aristocracy, thereby shaping the peasantry as a political force in struggle with the aristocracy earlier than in many other societies. Another geographic factor is Scandinavian iron ore. The abundance of iron ore, in particular in Sweden, resulted in an immigration of skilled metal workers from Germany that helped establish a metalwork industry by the late Middle Ages, establishing an additional economic sector outside of aristocratic control. The final geographic factor was the high latitudes with their extremely cold winters. Winters always necessitate storage economies that save harvests and fuel for the duration of the winter months. And in Scandinavia, especially cold and long winters facilitated an especially extensive storage economy. 
Over the centuries, this created a tradition of communities working together for a common good and a social attitude that saw good times as an opportunity to prepare for bad times, not just as individuals, but as a community. Through the storage of supplies as a community, common economic institutions were established by a peasantry that were run by that peasantry. Scandinavian communities started to create communal institutions for the wider benefit of their society, run by them and trusted by them earlier than anywhere else. This is an aspect often mischaracterized and misunderstood by outsiders. Infamously, the American far right likes to deride this aspect of Scandinavian society as communism, even though it came into existence centuries before Marx was even born. Equally false, Marxists enjoy describing it as socialism, even though its establishment during medieval feudalism contradicts Marxist theory of history and developmental stages, and it didn't come to be through class struggle as Marxist theory demands, but through cold weather. We should, however, be careful not to overemphasize the importance of geography in political development. Cold climates necessitating storage economies also existed in Russia, there, however, the monarch was able to cement an absolutist state institution. Shorelines favoring trade by sea also existed in Britain, but the English aristocracy managed to maintain control over the trade ports and the monarch remained powerful enough to control trade monopolies. Scandinavia went through this political development on its own and in a unique way. And the ultimate result of it was that while most of Europe exited feudalism with political conflict between an aristocracy and monarch over the establishment of an absolutist state, Scandinavia exited feudalism with a significantly more empowered peasantry than the rest of Europe. One of the most significant events that led to the establishment of a social commitment to a common public good in Scandinavia was the Protestant Reformation. The Reformation almost coincided with the breakup of the Kalmar Union, a union kingdom that had united all of Scandinavia. Out of its collapse, Denmark emerged with Iceland and Norway under its rule, but also with a crisis of governance and monarchy. During the Middle Ages, the Riksrat, a council of aristocrats and bishops, had gained significant power from the king. At the beginning of the Protestant Reformation, a crisis in succession to the throne led to the Riksrat postponing the election of a new king and governing the country. The aristocracy was in theory meant to represent the general public, but in most cases the aristocracy used the parliamentary assemblies to gain power at the expense of the king to then take advantage of the peasantry. As Lutheranism spread among the peasantry and lower nobility, it set them up against the aristocracy and the Catholic bishops. Civil war broke out, and using the support of a Protestant peasantry and lower nobility, Christian III seized the Danish throne in 1536. Christian was a very zealous Protestant who established a national Lutheran church and furthered Lutheranism throughout Denmark. And Lutheran theology, combined with the already more empowered Danish peasantry, manifested a substantial change in Danish society. A core principle of Lutheranism is that everyone should be able to read, understand and interpret the Bible. That faith must be made available and accessible to all for themselves, through themselves and to not be dictated to them by a religious authority. In Denmark, this resulted in Lutheran priests increasingly teaching the peasantry how to read and write. Literacy exploded among the Danish peasantry. Denmark was probably the first fully literate society of Europe. To further this, the Danish Lutheran Church built public schools in every village across Denmark to teach everyone how to read and write, and by the end of the 1500s, this system of schools had developed into a full-fledged public schooling system. Three centuries later, Denmark would be in fact the first country to introduce a compulsory public schooling system in 1813. Denmark, earlier than others through literacy, developed its peasantry into a well-organized and educated social class. A social class that had a vested interest in a common good of society, mobilized through the religious doctrines of Lutheranism and supported through economic structures established long before. And that social class started to act more assertively and demand more political powers by the late 1600s and early 1700s. 
The Danish monarchs still tried to build an absolutist state with power centralized in the monarch, just as every European monarch did. And just as in the rest of Europe, they mainly had to contend with the Danish aristocracy. Unlike in England, there was no permanent binding legal charter like the Magna Carta. Instead, each new Danish king had to sign a new charter called the Handfesting and struggled with the Danish aristocracy over which powers, rights and privileges to grant and seize. After losing a war against Sweden in 1660, the monarch used the resulting crisis to abolish the aristocratic parliamentary assembly and formally established an absolutist state. This absolutist state, however, continued to remain in conflict with the political and economic ambitions of the Danish aristocracy. As a result, starting in the 1700s, something unique happened the Danish kings started using the power of the absolute Danish state to increase the privileges and rights of the peasantry. The kings increasingly abolished the last vestiges of serfdom. They abolished the aristocratic right to use corporal punishment against tenants. Peasants were granted the right to privately own and inherit land. And the remaining restrictions on commercial activity in favor of aristocrats were lifted from the peasantry. Why? Did the Danish kings do this in pursuit of an absolutist state? Because the increasing enfranchisement of the peasantry came at the expense of the aristocracy, who were the main political obstacle to the king. This political development in social classes is very unique to Scandinavia. In England, the aristocracy and the monarch found a compromise that empowered the aristocracy as protectors of the monarchy in exchange for rights and privileges. In Prussia, the monarch recruited the aristocracy as officers in the building of a professional army and its bureaucracy to rule the state as a militaristic dictatorship. In France, the king struggled with the aristocracy to subdue them into the creation of an absolutist state at the expense of everyone else. In Russia, the king subdued the aristocracy and recruited them in an alliance to exploit the peasantry in an almost perfect absolutism. In Poland, the aristocracy formed a powerful political bloc that undermined the power of the king and state so they could exploit the peasantry on their own. In contrast to all of these European political developments, what makes the Danish and Scandinavian political developments so unique is that the king empowered the peasantry and recruited them as allies to undermine the political ambitions of the aristocracy. This empowered peasantry had a deciding impact on Denmark throughout the 1700s and 1800s. It is, for example, a reason why Denmark never extensively took part in European imperialism. The small Danish colonies in the Caribbean, India and West Africa were run by the Danish East India Company and were basically aristocratic monopoly ventures granted by the king or run by the king. They never enjoyed much public support. The evolving Danish citizenry saw the pursuit of wealth through conquests abroad as a waste when efforts could be made instead to build prosperity at home. What finally brought democracy to Denmark though, was not an internal development, but outside events that acted as a catalyst for internal political developments. During the Napoleonic Wars, Denmark sided with Napoleon and lost, which resulted in Denmark losing control of Norway to Sweden. But far more crucially, the German states received the right to interfere within internal political Danish matters because of the German populations in the provinces of Schleswig-Holstein. Class-based calls for political representation and rights now clashed with the ambitions of a wealthy German aristocracy of Schleswig-Holstein and created conflicts of national identity with the German population. Democracy was no longer just a class-driven political aspiration, but one of national identity. A religious revival movement emerged in the 1840s under Nikolai Frederick Severin Grundtvig, which mostly rallied small farmers together in demands for a private education system as an alternative to the public system. This movement, called the Grundtvigians, kicked off the establishment of a constitutional democracy with votes granted to all men by 1849. Democratic enfranchisement happened earlier than in the rest of Europe. An additional significant contribution to the creation of the Danish state institution was when Prussia went to war with Denmark over its German minority. 
Denmark lost the war and consequently lost Schleswig-Holstein. This left Denmark a lingually homogenous society with a public enfranchised by democracy that could consequently engage in the building of a state and common good without outside interference or distractions. Let's briefly return to the 1700s. The granting of property rights to small farmers was probably one of the most significant steps in Danish and in Scandinavian political development. This mainly began in Norway under Danish rule during the late 1700s through a process historians called the individualization of agriculture. The customary large land holdings became replaced with small family farms. That small family farm, starting in Norway, over the centuries became the basic unit of production of the Scandinavian economy. When industrialization came, there was consequently no mass disruption of communal structures. Industrialization throughout the rest of Europe mostly transpired through large land holdings, clearing the land, disrupting the craftsmen and tenant farm economies. The communities built around these economic sectors fell apart, migrated into cities, became part of the industrial factory work complex and created a new social class, the working class. That, to a large extent, did not happen in Scandinavia, or at least very differently. The commercialization and industrialization of Scandinavian agriculture was a very slow and gradual process that took from the 1780s to the 1950s. It also remained in control of the small farmers and small business owners and their communities. As a result of this, the strong communal bonds and structures that had developed in the centuries before were preserved. This includes the customs of communal care that evolved out of a peasant winter storage economy. And it should not come as a surprise that most political movements and parties in early democratic Scandinavia have their origins in the Scandinavian countryside. These forces came into political opposition with more urban elites, but within the democratic framework, neither side opposed social institutions of common care. The Grundvigians, a religious political farmers movement that in the end established a constitutional monarchy in Denmark, are a prime example of this. Their interest was in the shaping of a state that through its institutions represented and set the standards of the moral norms of wider society. Their opposition to the public schools was not as much an opposition to the state as it was an opposition to the Danish monarchy's concept of the word public and common. During their time in government, they renamed the Danish public institutions from being public, such as public schools, to the people's schools. For them, common institutions of care and service for society had to be free institutions, in that they were based on voluntary service to society rather than a state-mandated or dictated service for society. Service to society should not be mandated, it should be something that citizens engage in due to their desire to care for each other. This may seem like a side note, but it is the defining and substantial difference between the formation of the Scandinavian and the German ideals for a common good and welfare state. If you went to school in Germany, you were probably taught that Bismarck invented our public healthcare system, but that is not true. The first German public healthcare system were insurance pots created by Prussian factory workers in the 1860s. Those signed labor union agreements to add a percentage of their earnings into a common healthcare pot. When this became widespread in Germany, Bismarck mandated it and built state institutions that seized control over these insurance pots as a state-run public health sector. Bismarck did not do this because he cared for the health of the German factory worker. He did this because he feared the German factory worker was creating an institution independent and outside of the absolute militaristic Prussian state. The German welfare state was created as a mechanism of state control. In contrast, the Scandinavian welfare state came out of a universalist voluntarism, a social commitment to a common good. By the 1880s, the industrialization of the Danish economy started to go into full swing, earlier than anywhere else in Scandinavia, and developed an industrial worker class. While in the rest of Europe, industrialization led to poor houses, strict moral codes, struggles with unions, fear of revolution, Marxist movements and strikes, in Denmark it resulted in a political debate over the Arbeitersporksmal, 
the worker question, as in, to what extent is society responsible to care for the needs of its industrial workers and laborers? And the result was the establishment of the first welfare state. Denmark introduced a public pension fund with an official retirement age of 60 in 1891, a public healthcare system in 1892, a public worker's accident insurance in 1898, unemployment insurance was passed in 1907, and disability benefits introduced in 1913. The Scandinavians championed something new during the late 19th century. State programs for social care throughout the world before then usually had been done as poor laws, as a sort of charity that society would care for the misfortunate. This notion is something that the Scandinavians abandoned, instead advocating for institutions of social insurance and social responsibility. This was combined with a policy of expanding the collection of data throughout the country. Denmark, like no other country, is obsessed with statistics, and that has its origins in the 1890s. The Danes established state institutions that by their design existed to collect data and go out of their way to find problems for the state to solve, rather than wait for an unknown problem to fester, grow and become inevitable to confront. A positive state that exists to serve and work on improving society, rather than a passive state that leaves society largely to itself and only resolves problems when confronting them becomes inevitable. You can see the legacies of this throughout Scandinavia. Norway has the world's largest sovereign wealth fund, collected out of the revenue of its oil and kept for public investments and as a resource in case things go south. A reason why Denmark leads the world in green energy reform is because it has state institutions built around the state seeking out problems to solve. The Danes consequently tackled climate change and most social and political issues earlier than anyone else. During the interwar period, Denmark then pioneered something new again, this time through the newly developed socialist movement, specifically through a crisis in socialism caused by the First World War. Denmark remained outside of this war, but the way in which industrial workers throughout Europe had cheered for and joined that war, and how socialist parties throughout Europe had joined the cause for war, left the Danish socialist movement dismayed and in an identity crisis. It was proof that there was no such thing as a socialist international, no global workers' movement, but that national interests superseded the social-political demands of factory workers in countries. The Danish socialists consequently increasingly abandoned the idea of establishing a global international socialism and opted increasingly for the idea of establishing socialism at home. A functioning national community was seen as a requirement to establish an international community. Then came the 1917 revolution, and this event divided the European socialist movement into factions who advocated for the proletarian dictatorship and those who wished to establish socialism through a liberal democratic state. The Scandinavian socialist movements were completely reshaped by the end of the Second World War. In Sweden, they advocated for a Folkhemmet, meaning a people's home, and the motto of the Danish Socialist Party became Denmark for Folket, meaning a Denmark for the people people, in this context being defined as a cultural and public body represented through a public vote. It ties into and builds upon the idea of an institution of common good for voluntarism, and also separates Scandinavia from other definitions such as the racist German definition of a people as a biological entity of a folk. Social policies in Denmark were not the result of class appeasement or state control, but common commitment to stability. Danish socialists increasingly abandoned Marxist calls for proletarian dictatorship and Marxism, and hence social democracy as a movement was born in Denmark between 1914 and 1929. The Danish resistance leader against Nazi occupation, Hal Koch, probably described best what made Scandinavian democracy so unique. He stressed the difference between a protective democracy, which has certain rights and laws enshrined as unviolatable under any circumstances, like the United States with its constitutional amendments, and a developmental democracy, which is a democracy that evolves with time to adapt to new cultural, economic and social realities. Denmark, and all Scandinavian states for that matter, are developmental democracies that adapt to new cultural and economic developments for a common good. That is something that in many ways separates Scandinavian democracy from other forms of democracy. And it is how Denmark got to Denmark. There is a note on which I want to end this video. 
This entire development that I described here is what many historians consider the founding structures of a political movement called social democracy, and Denmark to be the birthplace of social democracy. And that contradicts what a lot of people believe and have heard, because the German social democrats always claim that they invented social democracy. Well, they're actually kind of lying, both to you and themselves. The German SPD used to be called the Socialist Party. It came to be as a Marxist socialist movement in industrial Prussia. It advocated for the overthrow of capitalism and the establishment of socialism. So when did the German Socialist Party become the Social Democratic Party? Well, during the Nazi regime, a lot of German and Austrian socialists went to exile in Scandinavia. This includes Willy Brandt, who even married a Norwegian, and the Austrian Bruno Kreisky. It was during this exile in Sweden, from 1933 to 1945, where the German democratic left was born. At the end of the Second World War, the German Socialist Party kept losing elections advocating for socialism. Then Brandt became the leader of the German party and Bruno Kreisky became the leader of the Austrian party. They changed their parties into adopting a more Scandinavian political outlook and social principle, embracing democracy and abandoning Marxism and socialism, renaming themselves as social democratic, emphasizing the democratic part, and were consequently elected chancellors of both their respective countries. They then established social democracy so well that German social democrats get away with claiming that they invented it. After the collapse of the Franco regime, Willy Brandt, who worked as a socialist activist in Barcelona during the Spanish Civil War, helped Felipe González reshape the Spanish Socialist Party into a social democratic party. In many ways, this Danish idea has conquered much of the European democratic left, from Germany to Spain to Austria to Italy. It also failed in some places. Neil Kinnock tried to turn the British Labour Party into a social democratic party and failed at the process. But there is still a good reason why I want to end this video on that note. My videos often describe century-long political developments resulting in our modern institutions. And many in my audience get the impression from these videos that this means we are prisoners of history that it is close to impossible to effectively change and reform a social or state institution established throughout many centuries. And that is not the case. I believe that this example, more than anything else, proves that point. You can get to Denmark. The question only is, should you? In the next video, we will discuss the origins of the Greek debt crisis, in particular the political structures that made it possible in the first place. And for the video you just watched, I have to give special thanks to the American YouTuber Gascony, the Palestinian-American YouTuber Beast Process, and the Indonesian artist Menchevik Among Us. November was an awful month in which much went wrong. I broke my drawing pad, got sick, and one of the artists I hired ran into problems as well. We lost almost three weeks of work. And this project almost collapsed. However, when word spread of the problems that we were having, these three guys decided to turn up and basically say, hey, I heard you were having a hard time, let us help you. And I am so grateful that they did. They basically saved this project. So please go check out their channels. I will leave the links to them in the description. If you want to support this channel, you can do so via Patreon, channel membership, or PayPal donation. I hope to see you all soon for the next video.